All right, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Cecilia. I'm Field Application Specialist at Selink. And today I would like to present you some of our applications and um, yes, so who we are. And uh, I will also not try to do it a commercial one, but just a little bit of us uh, to us. So for those who are not familiar with us, um, we are Selink. And we are the first uh, bioink company re revolutionizing the bioprinting field. So our mission is to provide 3D bioprinting technologies, products and services to create, understand and master biology. So we are focused on solving three core challenges of the modern healthcare. The first one I would like to mention is that the cost and duration of drug development processes, so that the fact that nine out of 10 drugs fail in the clinical stages, show that the industry must be disrupted. And to overcome this challenge, some significant advantages um, or advancements need to be made. So bioprinting has immense potential in the drug discovery realm as developing more relevant models and they make it easier to identify which drug are most likely to success in clinical trials and which aren't. So this would reduce time and cost to the market. Another point I would like to mention is that researchers can also waste up to $2 billion uh, by using the wrong method. So we believe that bioprinting has the ability to reduce the number of animal models being used right now to test uh, products because bioprinting constructs with human cells is a better feedback system than animals. This leads me to um, here this preclinical model for drug discovery. It has been proven that 3D cultures are representatives of real cell environment. Growing cell in a flask on a rigid sub substrate like a petri dish is simply not the way to go to understand how cells function in the human body. 3D cell cultures are much better indicators. They mimic 3D to more architecture, which makes them more physiologically relevant and predictive compared to 2D cultures. There are several techniques. So there's the matrix free technique that includes liquid overlay, hanging drops, spinner flask, magnetic leviation. Those techniques are relatively inexpensive and quick, but what they lack is the cell to ECM interaction. In contrast to this, 3D scaffolds provide the cell ECM interaction that is needed to get a full picture of, for example, cell arrangement and the behavior of it. They provide an ideal environment for drug discovery application. The ECM scaffold for them allows to tune the properties. So you can tune stiffnesses of the hydrogel to, um, of the tissue that you like to mimic. In addition to that, testing on animals presents some significant ethical issues. Furthermore, animals have different physiological um, properties than humans, which is a primary reason why nine out of 10 drugs fail in the clinical stages. And for those reasons, we deeply believe that scaffold-based 3D culture um, methods are the future for drug discovery, oncology, and any other of application. With this said, I would like to present you today two case studies. Um, in both papers, one of our extrusion bioprinters was used to support the research, but both in two different types of ways. Um, the first case is focused on a microfluidic chip and combines basically both worlds, microfluidics and bioprinting in one approach. The second paper is focused on a drug testing platform in which they used um, our, our printer to actually print the whole complete model and used it to test two different drugs. Let's start with case one. Okay, so in this paper, they used the BioX technology to create a microfluidic chip. Here's so-called tumor immune microenvironment, or in short, time on a chip by using a combination of gel and pleuronics. This study um, showed that, um, or the study studied how the tumor immune microenvironment influences the tumor invasion and metastasis. Just as a brief background, they used a combination of ovarian cancer cells and neutrophils. And when, neutrophil, when a neutrophil is, neut uh, is stimulated, stimulated, sorry, <clears throat> stimulated by an infection, in this case, by the tumor cells, they start to release those so-called nets, the neutro neutrophil extracellular traps that can either sequester circulating tumor cells or initiate the tumor invasion. To get a clear picture, they created this microfluidic chip in which they studied how tumor invasion depends on neutrophil migration and net formation. So this is how the chip looked. Um, and I would just quickly go on how the chip was built. So on the bottom, there is a magnet. And on top of that, they printed a microwell system that contained the tumor spheroids. On the top of that, they added a collagen to act as a stromal layer. So to give it a whole micro, uh, uh, or to, to provide a real micro environment. That O-ring allows the control of the thickness of the stromal layer. 
Um, and on top of that is the porous membrane. And on that membrane, they printed um, the microfluidic channel using the BioX technology. Just to go through uh, into more details here, so they started to print the channel using chloronic ink and positioned afterwards the microfluidic tubes. Um, to go in more detail, um, no, so the second step was in was to print the JAMA bioink as kind of a support and to cover this part of uh, the chip with a synthetic photopolymer to remain the surface integrity. Afterwards, everything was cross-linked and the microfluidic uh, of the microfluidic part and the pleuronics was um, removed by using chilled water. So pleuronics is sacrificial ink and is washed away within 10 degrees or lower than 10 degrees. Afterwards, they put another culture dish on top to contain everything and last added another magnet that basically hold the whole chip in place. And with this setup, they created a microfluidic device containing the ovarian cancer cells in small microwells covered by a collagen-based stroma which is connected to a microfluidic channel in which they were able to flow media, including the neutrophils. So using this device, they observed that neutrophils respond to the growing tumor spheroids through both chemotaxis and generation of neutrophil extracellular traps, the nets that I talked before. The formation of the nets simulated the, um, the reciprocation of the tumor cells from the aggregated state to collectively invade into the surrounding collagen matrix in a manner more significant compared to the response to no, um, to, like in compared to the response um, to no tumor derived stimulated such as transforming growth factors and interleukin 8. This effect was reversed by drug induced inhibition of the NETS formation, suggesting that the induced NETS by cancer cells could be a pro -micro microtary uh, tumor behavior. Further, we, um, or they additionally um, reported a previously under, I, un, identified location um, dedicated mechanism of those nets, in which the nets formation within the stromal exocellular collagen matrix around the spheroid and not the tumor con um, contacted nets is important for the induction of the collective invasion of the ovarian cancer cells, thus providing a rational um, um, new method for anti-tumor therapeutic research. So to conclude that the neutrophils do respond uh, to the tumor by migrating towards the tumor and the form formation of the nets, but only the nets in the stroma and not in the vasculature of the tumor mediated tumor invasion. All right, the second case study I would like to um, show you is, the, um, is a bioprinted cancer model, um, a, neuroplast a neuroplastoma cancer model um, as a drug testing platform. So the motivation here is that first, 2D monolayer uh, cultures have greatly contributed to the basic knowledge of genetic factors that drive for, uh, the transformation of somatic cells into the tumor cells. These studies, however, cannot mimic the 3D architecture of tumor and the interaction with the surrounding microenvironment. To this end, animal models were developed, which allow study tumor development in a complex physiological environment. Although these models are or have made an enormous contribution to the field, the pro, uh, they provide a um, xenogenic microenvironment instead of a human one, and that therefore have limited relevance to the human um, physiology. Consequently, the average success rate of, um, as I mentioned before, for translating of insights from animal models to clinical trial is less than 8%. And this is also, um, uh, this is kind of like, um, goes in line with um, com comprehensive other studies um, saying that um, the failure rate of drug candidates in oncology is above 97%. That's why it is necessary to go or, or to identify an alternative strategy um, to um, disrupt this type of market. So the goal here was to evaluate the sensitivity of a neuroblastoma cells and renal cells. Um, so they used IMR32 cells and renal HEC. 293 cells and primary kidney fibroblasts towards the anti cancer drug panobinostat, and as a comparison to see how cells react in general to drug they use the cytotoxic substance plasticine and they compared it in 2D and 3D. So, here are some results. Um, of course, this is just a highlight, um, so please feel free to reach out if you would like to see the whole paper. Um, here, what they did was they char characterized the um, drug sensitivity um, of the neuroblastoma cells and the HEC cells. So they started 
small and they just used a 3D culture um, and compared it to 2D, 2D culture. Um, they just used a normal or simple grid structure for the first pr preliminary tests. So the most interesting outcome of this comparison was that the IC50 values for the neuroblastoma cells, the IMR32 cells, for panipinostat were approximately one order of magnitude higher for the 3D cultures than for the 2D monolayers. Um, this difference was less pronounced when they compared it to um, with the HAC cells. Um, but what they could see is that the therapeutic window was broader in the bioprinted constructs, uh, meaning that the cells were more sensitive um, to the to the certain um, drug when when um, placed in a 3D construct compared to 2D cell culture. So the next thing they did was that they tested the cytotoxicity in a 3D construct by just assessing the 3D models. Um, and they used again the panobinostat, the cancer drug uh, on the bioprinted cells. Um, in this case, what they did was that they used um, the HEC cells and the IMR32 cells, the neuroblastoma cells separately in grid models and treated with varying concentration of the panobinostat. And more than 75% of the HEC um, 293 cells survived using the panopinostat concentration of up to 15 nanomolar. Um, and only the highest dose led to an obvious decrease, like to the cell death. In contrast to that, um, panopinostat started to kill cells at much lower concentration um, for the neuroblastoma models. Um, and yeah, so. Um, that, that that just concluded that the um, the cancer drug is really effective when it fo when focusing on the cancer cells. I have here shown the cytotoxic assays they did in a two-day monolayer model. So for, on, at first you see that this, the results are the same. So the um, cancer drug is um, starting to decrease the viability of the cancer cells that the, are the IMR32 cells on the right in red. Um, but it also starts to decrease the, the um, compared to 3D, the um, HEC cells at the very, like at the lower com um, concentration compared to 3D. Um, that means that not only the HEC, three, uh, the HEC cells, um, also later the primary kidney fibroblast they used for the final model became more resistant when they cultured it in 3D. So again, the therapeutic window was, was bigger. Okay, so this is the final experiment. And in this final experiment, that's when they designed the model that is now um, called the drug testing platform. So you see it here in a 48 well plate. It's not looking too complex here on the well plate, but what you see on the right, um, the, the dashed line should support, um, should, should support actually the model they designed. It's simple, but um, still um, does its value. Um, so they studied here the primary human kidney fibroblast. They were printed in the cancer um, model. So you had a center containing of the neuroblastoma cells and surrounded was, um, they were surrounded by a ring of primary fibroblasts. First, what I wanna mention is that the hydrogels they, they used actually supported that the cells did not start to like interact too much and that the model was stable in itself. And then what they saw was basically what they saw before. Um, they just wanted to confirm it in a more relevant model and more, using more relevant cell types cell death appeared in the cancerous part starting at 10 um, nanomolar of panobinostart and the increasing cell death of the neuroblastoma cells was um, with increasing concentration. And um, the fibroblast started to die at higher concentrations of 100 um, nanomolar. And when you compare those values with the literature of pharmaceutical um, drug testing, this is, um, goes in line with the regulations of the pharmaceutical drug testing. So as a take-home message, um, they they this or what they decide decided to take a, for you to take uh, take with um, the study is that it is possible to develop a human relevant model um, for drug development in general cancer studies and um, any other immunotherapeutic approaches. It was able to create a simple model that could distinguish the cancer specific drug um, and also um, when comparing it with the site. A general cytotoxic drug, um, you saw the difference between both drugs and um, the efficiency of it. Um, and what you could do is using this model with any other cancer 
um, that you would like to study in and um, use it also for personalized treatment strategies. So this is what they would like to, um, or what they proposed in the study is how they, what the next step would be is either using it um, with um, patient derived tumor cells to develop personalized treatment strategies or um, consisting of a different micro environment composed of non-cancer cells, not only for the cytotoxic sub uh, substances as, I sh as they showed here, but also for immunotherapeutic approaches. And uh, one part, uh, one last point I want to mention here is that, um, or they mentioned is that they used it commercially for the printer for this, and that with this studies can be easily reproduced. So lastly, before I end my presentation, I would like to introduce um, you to our new technology um, at Selling, which um, will push the boundaries for science even further. Just quickly to introduce you to, to the new term, it's biodispensing, a term that we have came up with to describe what the BioCell X is actually doing, um, which I will show you in a small video uh, in a second. Up to, the, up to now, um, there were two main classes of devices. You have on the one hand side, on the one spectrum, the bioprinters, which I just explained um, what they can do um, using different tissue models, uh, create complex models for tissue and organs with different bio -ings. And on the other side, we have liquid handlers. They are feasible to dispense liquids with properties close to water, but they cannot create a complex tissue model. So imagine that the BioCellX is basically in, the, in between of those. So the biodispensing lies between bioprinting and liquid handling. Um, here you can use um, ECM models. So um, you can actually print with hydrogels and um, create models like droplet models, droplet in droplet, drop arrays and uh, single layer structures. Um, and because of their design for the geometries with these materials, they can precisely be tuned and, highly, and are highly reproducible. reproducible. Um, the second advantage is that because of the dis um, they dispense in simple models, um, you can create you can create those models in a higher throughput manner. Um, so you can go up to 96 well plate um, that uh, will or even go up to 384 well plates. This brings me to the new device that I would like to show you here in a small video. Um, I don't know if you actually hear the music. <laughs> All right. And with this, I would like to say thank you um, for your attention. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me um, or to my colleagues that are at the booth. Um, also, if you'd like to see one application of the BioCell X, um, it's pretty new and we just launched it. So we do not have a publication yet, but we have already some in-house data. Um, and if you're interested, just let me know. I can share them with you. Thank you.